All right, before I started, I, I realized there is a, a issue that I would like to clarify regarding homework assignment number one. Um, I This is the file I provided um, as uh, during one of the lecture. And in this class, thank you for one of the students who actually came to my office hour and he actually asked an excellent question. And I realized I did something, uh, uh, um, I might have confused at least some of you. Hold on, let me just turn off the light. Turn off the light. Let me do it. One second, I want to turn on my VPN as well. Okay, great. All right. So, um, if, if, so if anybody uh, doesn't have a seat, I still have a one chair here, just to let you know. Okay, so in this code, uh, you see that I actually comment out Felix hacking. So I, I, what I really want to demonstrate is a function called uh, how do you eliminate? I really want to demonstrate is that, well, you can call this function called filter words. So the, the thing is that the filter words need to provide some array called impossible word, impossible alphabet, whatever, to help that to eliminate. So the thing is that in this code, I didn't actually show how do you actually come up with that words. So that's why uh, I think one of the students provide three five-letter words that cover 15 alphabet. So that is a good way for you to actually quickly make a few guesses to actually be able to reduce. So you can actually, because we don't have any limits on how many guesses you want to do. So what you literally can do is that you can come up with say six different words or, or even 10 different words that cover all 26 uh, letter. Uh, in that sense, you will be able to construct the, uh, the impossible array yourself. But what I didn't tell you this code is I actually did the hack. So what did I hack is because I have access to the solution, so I essentially use a solution to help me to filter out the words. That, that's completely cheating, okay? So don't, don't, don't follow me on that. I'm just doing hacking over there. So sometimes, you know, computer, we, we, we like to do a little bit of hack and just try to get an idea. But that's not the intention for your solution to use that hack. Your solution, you must find out your own impossible word. And then so you can construct the wide, right impossible array. What you might be able to do is you actually initially uh, construct the array with only eliminate maybe five letter and then gradually you grow and eventually you will limit your, your letter to exactly five. And then you will be able to uh, dramatically reduce the possible solution. So that, that's, that's the uh, clarification I have. Okay, for homework assignment number one. Is that is that clear? So I forgot who actually asked that question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, there might be another hack over there. It's supposed to uh, just check the impossible. Maybe you already have the solution. The only thing is that maybe the, the somehow the code, um, there, there's a place which I actually use the word solution to do that. But if you have other place um, that you can actually get it to work, that's fine. As long as you make sure that your code does not use the array called words, that's the five letters that's generated by um, the word or C program. Okay, yeah, please. Then, then you, you're probably okay. And also just to let you know, you might want to try a few things because some of the words, some of the word might be easier to guess. Some of the words might be okay. As long as your logic of your program makes sense, then you, you don't have problem. But if you feel you didn't do the work, but somehow the solution came out, uh, let's let's uh, show, show me your code and I can probably take a look uh, from office hour or discussion, okay? There was another hand. There was another hand. Anyone? Okay. All right. Good. All right. So the, this. Oh, yes, please. 
It is your choice. You can actually write this code. But if you want to actually just develop your own code, that's fine with me. But the thing is that your code need to need to have an interface, right? To to actually like this interface, you will be able to solve the, the Wordle problem. I do recommend you to use this code because this code already provides a lot of interface, like uh, so you, you reduce your development time. But if if some of you really want to you know, um, um, develop something really, really nice, it's okay. I, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. Okay, thank you. Okay, the, the second thing I want to show you is that um, it's about today, participation credit. Um, I, I want to actually show you first is that, um, Originally, I actually want you to pull out your computer to use your uh, Unix environment to do this. And, uh, but I, I actually tested uh, for many weeks. Our VPN situation is still not ideal. Let me actually show you what's supposed to do. So I actually, let me, let me actually go to the server. One second. I want to show you the code, and then I will tell you what you sh you you should do for for today's uh, session. Okay, so I'm actually logged in to a server which is called Cyrus, and Cyrus has IP address one sixty one sixty eight dot two thirty seven dot six dot one zero two, and and Cyrus actually is a is a um, is a machine that's actually in the engineering building. And therefore, you need to have the VPN, engineering VPN, or uh, the library VPN for you to log in. However, for some reason, that uh, the, um, the library VPN is actually very unreliable. That's why I actually changed a lot of things today, uh, sorry, this quarter, to avoid that problem. Because I, I found out last quarter I spent uh, at least one third amount of time. It's just dealing with uh, the, the networking issue. So suppose it should work like this way. So by the way, this is a little bit tutorial of Unix. Uh, John Chapman supposed to already uh, finish his uh, um, 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 tutorial for Unix. I, I told him I need to buy VPN today. So he probably already announced it on, on Discord. Uh, I hope I haven't checked, but there is a one command which is a super useful to do Unix development is called Screen. Um, screen basically allow you to have, so, so usually when you actually run a terminal, especially this terminal is on a cloud, on a server, once you log out, it's already gone. I mean, when you log out, that's actually uh, the, the, the session is done then your program cannot work. And remember I told you that the first time I need to have this is I realized during 2016 election, I need to deal with a, a, a JSON about uh, Clinton and the Trump debate. And that itself is one JSON is about two gigabyte. Actually, sorry, two gigabyte, two terabyte, I forgot. It's getting really, really big. And, and the thing is that I actually have to stay online for a long time from my server to uh, talk to Facebook. And then what I want to have a facility is that I can leave my program running on a server while I'm completely log off. So screen is a tool for you to do that. So, so, so if you don't remember anything, just remember something called screen, S-C-R-E-E-N. So usually when I do S screen, I actually check screen LS, means that how many screen I actually have. And then you see that this is actually from even last year, I have a great server, it's still running. Okay, I still have all the server running for a long time. And I'm actually going to the, the homework assignment number one. So I actually do, I need to switch to that server. So I just say screen minus R, resume to that particular session. I would say F2021, HW1. Okay, good. 
All right, so this is actually a server that I actually, the first one were assignment back then, I'm actually asked students to submit a JSON about some of this information, which I want you to actually submit today. So I'm actually run the server. When I run the server and then I go to my client, which is on my machine here. So this is actually my local machine on my MacBook. So I would just say, let me see, what did, what did I do? Yeah, you see, I just called the client program. So that program is called a server program. This is the server program. And wait a minute, where's my server? Okay, my server program is here. This one is old one. I killed this one. So this one is running ECF36BHW1 server. But that don't worry about this one because this is not your homework. This was a year ago. And in the, in the client program over here, I'm actually going to run the program. So I actually submit um, the, the program is called HW1 client and the IP address, I, I said Cyrus IP address is 169.237.6.102. And then there was a, something called poor number, which you don't have to worry about that right now, but I'm going to teach you about IP address and poor number a little bit later. I use a 95600. That's actually matching what I said here. You see that here? I said 95600. I, I like the Davis uh, zip code. So I always use that as my uh, poor number. And 95600. And then I submit my uh, student ID number, 1234566. Uh, that, that's my favorite number, actually. Uh, so I, I, I hit it. And what's happening is that, OK, the server actually receive it. And what server did is the server actually checked the database because this server is linking to the student information or faculty information. So they actually know what this IP address, what this uh, student ID, and he actually found it correctly. That means you're in the class. If you don't have that, that means you're not in the class. So this one, you can see that I actually get back to me when I type that number, you said, the name is Felix Wu, SID is this, UID. It has a bunch of information, including IP address. But this IP address is 169.237.233.18. That is IP address that currently assigned to this machine. So when the server receives it, it will be able to tell where you send this from. So it's kind of a server with IP address. And it's kind of helped us to do a lot of interesting uh, distributed application. I'm just show you that if I don't have this number, let's say I hit a, a, a bad number, whatever number. Okay, if, because I hit the wrong number, uh, it, it will say, well, I need not bad because it's not in the database. So this is basically a simple client server program. I used to ask the student to play around, okay. All right, for now for you, I actually gave you two hours to do the following, to kind of mimic, but I actually announced, if you actually check the canvas, uh, this is how I'm going to take your uh, uh, um, um, uh, participation credit. And I want you to actually look at this. There is a, in, the, in your homework, I should have posted on all three sessions. You see, I, I, I realized until this afternoon, for session three, I actually didn't post uh, homework assignment number two. I did post homework assignment number two on session one and session two. So, so now you should all have this. And what I want you to do is that you actually need to respond to this on Canvas. Submit a text file. You have until five o'clock, 4.45 to do that. And what you want to do is that you just want to write the JSON. I want you to write a JSON, but then you include this information. Let me actually make it bigger. Uh, you have a status say successful name, whatever your name, and you put your student ID, user ID, which is your Kerberos ID, and you put your own session, and then whatever time it is uh, using this kind of format, and then this part is interesting. I want you to find out whatever device you're using, what's your IP address? What's your IP address? Um, if you have, by the way, 
today I will stay here after uh, 3.59, sorry, after the, the end of class for another hour. So if you have a question of any of this, including how to find your IP address, I'm here to help, all right? So it's, it's good for you to start learning this concept about you know, uh, your machine and you can do a little bit distributed uh, internet-based uh, activity using JSON. And, and the thing is that you might want to actually know how, what is the IP address, which is a very important concept. I mean, essentially today, if you want to get connected on the internet, you have to have IP address and that's usually automatically assigned to you and how you're going to find out. I mean, for example, on my computer, I, I will do this differently on my computer. And this is actually typically true for most of the Unix environment. I just say if config minus a. You see, I hit type of if config and one of my IP address from the beginning. Let me see, which one is this? This must be the first one. No, nope. the first one is local. Let me actually check. Where is my EM1? There's too many. This machine has too many interface. Bridge LL. This is one? This is wireless, right? Oh, you know what? Because I'm using VPN. Hold on. Can anybody see my Ethernet address? Ah, here, this is my Ethernet address, EN0. In my case, it says my INET address is 168.150.19.243. That's my IP address. And the reason this IP address is different from the IP address show on the server, because I was using the VPN. So my IP address looks like is beyond the end of the, the virtual private network. That's why the IP address is going to be different. So I want you to actually be able to find out whatever device you're using, what's your IP address and include that. Yes, and back. What, what, what do you mean the code? Or oh, the program? The program to do this? The tool is called ifconfig. ifconfig. Let me actually use, a, a, let's just do a Google search. There might be other play, other tool you can use, but IF config is the most IF config is probably the most uh, um, uh, powerful one to actually for us to understand your network interface. It's a wireless or internet. Yes, please. I Okay, if you do IF config, you see two INET, that means you have two IP addresses. You have, you actually, your machines, because some of us have multiple IP addresses. When, when I have my smartphone, um, I, I connect to 5G network, right? I also connect to Wi Fi. Then I actually have a two IP address. Then it's between your application and your system or operating system, decide which way they want to go. So that's why most of the time when you have your smartphone and you also have your Wi-Fi, it will go to Wi-Fi first. It will use that. But when your Wi-Fi is, is dead, then you need to switch back. That's why it has a little bit about this transition time. You will see your application kind of lacking or hanging. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's why it's interesting. You might not be able to tell which one is sent now, but the server end will know. The server end, when they receive it, they will be able to see your source IP address because they need that IP address to re reply, to send back to you. So that's why it's good to actually be able to know a little bit on both sides. Yeah. So in order to find which one is actually. You probably cannot do that. Um, in fact, I, I will say if your IP address, if your uh, machine has two IP addresses, I think any one of them will be fine. Yeah, but for this purpose, but if you want to really find out which one, uh, there are there are simple solution, there are more advanced solution. More advanced solution because in the in the your network stack, it will actually count 
how many packets you send out to each of the interface. So what you want to do is that before you send a packet, you actually check what's the count for both interface. And after you send, you see which one increase the, the transmission by one packet, then you know that one has been used. Okay. And yeah. to get the message that it's just sitting on the campus, are we just taking traffic? Right, right. Just, just, just copy and paste. Just okay. copy and paste that and then change your name and your, your student ID number and ID address. Okay, and then just submit that. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. What is for UID? What is for? UID is like my UID is FSW, the user ID. For example, my uh, Kerberos ID. Kerberos ID, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Kerberos ID is a Unix UID. Yeah, same thing. Okay. Yes, please. Again, SID is your ID number? Your student ID number. Yeah, don't tell your social security. <laughs> your student ID. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I got into trouble one time. I was actually flipped my uh, file, which included a student ID number on, on the screen got YouTube. Uh, the UC Davis official actually called me. Yeah. Of course, it doesn't matter. Just put anything you want. Okay. Yeah, I just want to you to know there is a concept called port. Okay. And then for, um, says like submit as a text. Text file. Text file. So it's not a JSON file. Or... Not a JSON file. Just just a text file that you kind of write the so text. Just copy and paste, change it, and resend it. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Some of the outcome. You can type it in. Whatever type it in, or I, I forgot how I check text or text file. I forgot how I how I actually check. Okay. Yes, please. Can you speak louder? Sorry. Uh. <laughs> yes, there is a way to do that. Let me see. I forgot how, how I did it. No, no, no you, you definitely can, can find your ID address on your phone. No, MAC address is not the same thing. MAC address is a lower layer. Well, let me see what I, how I can find it. Let's actually play a few minutes. Uh, let me do a Google. How to find my IP address on my oh yeah all right but, but it's an iPhone iPhone maybe it's a little bit different oh yeah yeah okay yeah yeah good just just whatever it's so good okay hey I solved your problem uh gentlemen over there and so you just actually hit this uh go to this this website Okay, will that work for any any machine? Okay, but the okay, yeah. In the Google, just say my IP address, right? Okay, that's great. It's just my IP address server, just like my server. So it will check, right? Okay, that problem solved. Okay, that's I forgot about that solution. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, how you can find it. But but there is a way you can actually go to your machine to actually find it as well. Because you see that like in this case, one oh okay. Let me check this one. You see the Google actually find my IP address is actually my VPN there because I go to engineering VPN, but my own address is actually a different one. All right, so it's it's interesting. IP address is always a a Useful tool, but it has a lot of quick people. Okay. Okay, I'll give you three minutes, then I'm going to today's lecture. Yes. Yeah. Your Kerberos ID. Okay, that's our Yeah, right. Your ID is your Kerberos ID.
Okay, any, any, if you have any question, you can ask me or ask your neighbor. It seems to me people are getting into that. That's great. I, I love that. Well, I'm actually bringing up my slide, what I'm going to talk about today. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, change whatever time you want. Yeah, yeah hopefully the, the time will change to the right time. Right now, yeah. Are we ever going to multi-threading or the swap? I I never actually went into multi-threading this class for my past few times. I don't I yeah, I I I I I don't plan to do that. Are you really interested in that topic? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I can probably create a special, you know, optional lecture. Let, 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 let's all I have. Yeah, let's do that. I, mean, I really appreciate it. And uh, it's optional. It's not going to be midterm final. It's not going to have a whole lot of assignment. Mandatory. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, um, if you uh, couldn't finish at this moment, I, I would like to start because you have another until uh, 440, 455. Uh, we still have about one, and, one hour and 20 minutes to do that. I, I need to uh, move on with my next topic. So let, let me actually just give you a, a uh, um, recap about what we have done so far. So we're trying to solve a, a problem. The problem could be really complicated. So sometimes I call it a complex system. Uh, Homer sometimes too, we look at uh, Little Red Riding Hood and uh, we could, if we, you can solve Little Red Riding Hood, you probably can solve uh, uh, Lord of the Ring or, or, or uh, Harry Potter or whatever uh, novel or whatever movie you want, all right? And, and the thing is that this complicated situation has object has a lot of function that's actually dealing with this object. So the, the first model, the first thing we are actually start to learn is called object in the model. So essentially homework sum number two is really have a very little about object oriented programming, but more about object oriented modeling. Because modeling is really important for you to actually be able to bring the power of the programming you're going to do. So for example, modeling, we actually convert that to uh, a set of class. And for example, uh, person class or thing class or GPS class. And from each of the class, we actually start to write code. For example, um, I hope actually right now I want to uh, say a little bit is that you have noticed I always split a class into the .cpp part and .h part. For example, I have a person.h and person.cpp. I have a, a gps.h and gps.cpp. And this separation is important because I can actually start to do the compiler separately. And once you have that, um, you have a box.h, box.cpp, and then what you do is what we call separate compilation. And this part, you actually be able to see that in the make file. That's why make file is not just a convenient tool, 
But Makefile is actually help you to actually do this kind of separation very nicely one time, and you will do that correctly. If you use a VS Code, you are actually going to do a um, uh, Makefile equivalent, but you're going to do that Makefile in JSON format, just like you know. So it's the same concept. It's about Makefile. So Makefile essentially what we're doing. Let's look at this this case. Is that I have a file called um, this this code here called box.cpp. This code is my uh, test program.cpp. They both have this code, including box.h. So what I did normally, it's a good thing, is that we actually compile it with this um, flag called minus C. So if you don't have that minus C, and that C, by the way, stands for compiler. If you don't have that C, it's actually going through the whole thing to generate, trying to generate the executable. So by the way, the compiler has three phases, really. The first phase in the C or C++ compiler is called preprocessor. So why is the preprocessor? I need to handle this kind of pound sign. Anything to do with pound sign or anything to do with the macro you define, which is also started with pound sign you define, all this need to be resolved in the preprocessing phase. And the second phase is called compiler phase. Compiler phase is convert your preprocessed C or C++ code into an object file. So if I put minus C, what it does is that it stopped when it generated object code. And therefore, after you've done the compiler, the next phase, once you generate both box.o and the main.o, what you need to do, the compiler, the third phase is actually doing the linking. The third phase is called linker. It's actually linking all the .o file together and finally generate the executable. If you actually look at the make file, let me just show you one of the make file we, we used last time. This is the make file. that we show you uh, last uh, Monday. So you can see here, the, the target I tried to generate is called test, HW2, homework two, F2022. And you can see that I have a bunch of rules. For example, this rule is generate GPS.O, which this rule you see, I put a minus C. Because when I have a minus C, it will generate the .o. So essentially, whatever command I put it here in the make file, this is called the execution part, it's going to match the target that I want to generate. OK, that's just the compiler phase. But the linking phase, I'm going to show you here. This part is the linking phase. Let me actually make my window a little bit wider so I don't have this. Ah, OK, fine. Good. Let's actually look at this part, this two line. Okay, this is in your in your uh, in the GitHub directory. You can see that I for this line the target is the test underscore hw two f twenty twenty two. That's that's actually my uh, target. I want to generate that. And the thing is that if you look at the whole thing, I don't have any minus c. G++, minor STD, C++ 14. And you see, I put a bunch of .o, test, homework 2, F22, .o, GPS .o, thing .o, person .o, jvtime .o. I put all the object file together, and I generate an output file. I said minus O as test, homework 2, F2022. And, and the thing is that I have to do that. Uh, by the way, if you don't write the minus O test, whatever, this part, it will generate an output file called a.out. So a.out is the default output. The only thing which I didn't explain to you uh, clearly is about this LD flag I put it here. The reason I have to put LD flag because let's look at what LD flag is. The LD flag is actually related to my JSON library. JSON library. So this line is basically tell the linker where to find the library to link 
the library in this case I actually need to link to the library called JSON uh, CPP. And the thing is for most of the machine, uh, even for the older Mac or Linux machine or or um, the um, WSL, you shouldn't need to do this because usually the the JSON.cpp, you see that when I have my old one, when I run it before, I just need to say minus L JSON CPP. I said, okay, I want to link to the JSON CPP library, but I don't have to say minus capital L. Minus capital L is basically telling the linker or telling the compiler where to look for other information. The other one you might encounter is minus capital I. It's the same thing for include by. And the reason for this machine, if you have a newer Mac, you likely need to do this because um, the newer Mac is actually not Intel CPU. The newer Mac is ARM 64-bit uh, CPU. And therefore you need to recompile a bunch of library for different architecture. And that's why for the newer Mac is actually put, putting in a, in a different directory. That's why the Mac, uh, doesn't even support GDB. It still support G++, but not supporting GDB anymore. So that that's kind of things I just want you to know what we're talking about. Preprocessor, compiler, and linker. And then if you don't understand why it is, uh, you can ask me or take a look at the make file about how the make file is constructed. Okay. All right, let me get back here. Actually here. Okay, once you have that, then that executable file can start executing. And essentially you're expecting the result is actually matching uh, what you have, your target uh, complex system. We're actually going to coming back this very soon. So just summarize what we what we talk about is the three phase preprocessing, compiling, and the linking, all right? All right, so now I'm going to officially enter chapter 12. So in chapter 12, um, we're going to go over mainly two things. The first thing is called operator overloading. And the second thing is constructor and destructor. So if you want your interest in this topic, you should actually uh, uh, read through your chapter 12 right now. Okay, so actually let's, let's look at the first thing. What do I mean by operator overloading? Let's look at a, this particular piece of code. Um, so I want to compare two objects. In this case, it's two box. I want to compare box one and box two. And so I might write the code like this. I said box one, which is an object, dot compare volume of the box with box two. So box two is the input argument to a member function of the first object, which is box one. So uh, if this is true, this is going to, uh, because of the way uh, the code was written, that compare volume is going to return uh, a Boolean as a result. And then therefore, uh, if this is true, then you're going to print the result. Box one is larger than box two. Okay, this is a one piece of code. I have a function try to compare uh, the volume of, the, of, of, of two different boxes. Okay, so now I'm going to write the code differently. I'm going to show you two different kinds of code. So the first code, I, the, the upper part is the one I just show you in the previous slide, but now I'm actually going to write the code looks like this, the second part. Okay, look at this part. So now instead of saying box1.compare something, I'm actually going to show you if box one is greater than box two. Okay. Yes, we're overloading the, upgrade, uh, the, the greater than operator. So it looks like I'm using the greater than operator. So by the way, um, the default, if you don't overloading anything, greater than is usually compared uh, with two different basic types. Basic type, what is the basic type? And, uh, integer, 
floating point, string, and probably Boolean as well. Okay, so it's it's called basic type. So basic type, we kind of know what greater than really is. I know it's our string, the C plus plus string is not a is not a basic type, it's also an archive type. All right. Uh, but in C you have the basic character star or pointer, that's actually a, a, a basic type. All right, so I want to ask you, um, which way do you prefer? By the way, I want to tell you this two piece of code, they're essentially doing the same thing. The different way of writing the code, but they are essentially the, the same thing. They are, accomplish the same result. So I want to ask you which 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 option do you think is better? Um, how many of you think that the second option is better? Okay. And how many of you think the first option is better? Okay. All right. We have a disagreement. That's great. I like that. By the way, um, this particular question I just asked you have no definite answer. It depends, right? So for those of you who actually like the the second option, why? Why do you think the second option you like it better? Yes, please. Uh, easier to read. Okay, easier to read. It's simple. Okay, good. How about, yeah? I'd also say as a compare volume doesn't really give you an understanding which one is bigger and which one is not bigger. I mean, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically, I don't know what's compared with this bigger. Yeah, right. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, um, for those who actually prefer the first one, can I hear somebody? Yes, please, in the back. Okay, so the, the first one has a better semantic meaning, right? We're comparing the box. Very good. Okay. Right. Okay. Both very good point. All right. I just want to take away about this is that um, I actually, I think both sides, you hit the, hit the nail correctly. Operate overloading is actually for readability. Or under, I mean, right now, I just want to let you know, writing code is not how much code you can write or how many lines of code you can write. It's really about whether you can write the code that other people can understand. I mean, in my experience, to write a code that's readable, that's actually much more important than other purposes in writing code. Okay, so I just want to tell you that it's important that operator overloading is for readability, less for convenience. I mean, you're saying, okay, I don't want to write type 20 character. I just want to put a greater than sign. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, okay? So, okay, let me actually show you some of the example. Um, so this is the way you declare operator overloading. I will show you some example. You will actually realize that why sometimes you want to use operator overloading, sometimes you don't. Um, Wow, I only have five more minutes? Okay, all right. So I, I will finish uh, this on Friday, but I have five more minutes, let me go through this. So this is the way I declare operator overloading. So in the class definition, I actually say Boolean because operator is uh, greater than is always return a Boolean. So operator greater than, this is the keyword operator and then put a greater than sign. And then I define, I, I put a const box uh, reference, uh, and then I say a box. And inside the implementation, I say I return volume, or I should say this to the volume is greater than a box dot volume. Okay, this is the implementation of the operator overloading. And then you can actually use this piece of code. Okay, let me actually just, show you that this this is the code that you need to do that. Um, How do you, I said, well, that's the, th this is the way you actually want to use the operator overloading by just saying box one is greater than box two. But the thing is that in your uh, class definition, you actually do operator greater than like that. Okay, so um, 
I'm actually just show you the code. I already give it to you last time. So you actually know what's what I'm talking about. Uh, this is the code from the GitHub. Uh, is a Monday. The code I I distribute on Monday. So if you go to person.h, sorry, I always forgot to put no new window, please. Inside the person, I have operator overloading, say operator equal equal. So equal equal in C or, or Java, probably I forgot Java is, is basically saying whether those two are um, uh, logically equivalent or not. So I'm actually overwriting the operator equal equal. And, and the thing is that here is an issue about the semantics. When I actually compare two person, what do I mean by compare two person? Am I comparing their name, their social security number, or I'm comparing their age, or I'm comparing their, uh, say, uh, uh, the blood pressure, uh, for example, or, or whether how many times that they have done certain thing. I mean, what kind of things when we have operator equal equal, uh, try to compare? We can decide. We can decide, but the thing is the readability is hard, right? What is the readability? Now let's actually, how do I know? I have to look at the code. Come here and then I say operator equal equal. And you actually look at the code. This is the way I actually get it. I say, I want to identify this are the two true people. So even though you can change your name, you can change your age, you know, your age will naturally change. But the thing is, these two are the same people based on some kind of identity. That's actually the semantic of the design of this piece of code. But the thing is that you have to look at this piece of code before you actually realize that is the definition, the semantic operator equal equal. So I'm going to stop here, but next time you will see that I strongly make an argument. Um, there are two principles in object-oriented programming. One is called encapsulation. One is called operator overloading. And unfortunately, operator overloading breaks encapsulation principle. And we'll see that uh, uh, on Friday. Okay, I'm going to stop recording.